Um, good afternoon and welcome everyone. Welcome. Um, I'm Ross Virginia. I'm a faculty member in the Environmental Studies program, but I also direct the Institute of Arctic Studies here at Dartmouth College, which is part of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure and an honor and a very exciting opportunity to be able to kick off the Stephenson Memorial Lecture today. Um, the Stephenson Lecture is an annual event. It was established by the Stephenson Arctic Institute of Iceland, and it honors the Arctic explorer, anthropologist, and former Dartmouth faculty member, Willemer Stephenson, 1879 to 1962. Um, we're also very pleased to have Dr. Tom McGovern here to deliver this address, and you can see his title there. And if you have not seen an image of Willemer Stephenson, here he is looking rather stern in this painting here, which hangs in our small Arctic library. Um, but he's quite a remarkable person, and I'll make some comments about him in a moment. Um, worldwide, there are really two institutions that sort of have a shared identity around Willemer Stephenson and his work and his legacy. Um, one is the Institute of Arctic Studies here at Dartmouth. The other is the Stephenson Arctic Institute in Akureyri, Iceland. Um, Dartmouth Institute of Arctic Studies was founded in 1989 um, and recognizing the long tradition of Arctic anthropology and Arctic studies at Dartmouth College. And today we work to draw students together, faculty, to um, sponsor research and, and, and better communicate and share the exciting work that's going on in the polar regions and to bring that to the Dartmouth community and the public at large. Um, this is actually the, the very first uh, Stevenson lecture was held in 1999 in Iceland, and it actually featured Dartmouth faculty member Oren Young, a very noted Arctic uh, political scientist and social scientist. And so that, that, that was a, a good beginning for both of us. Um, this is actually the third time this lecture has been held here at Dartmouth. In 2002, uh, Iceland's president, uh, President Grinson, spoke to us. And, and emphasize the importance of the relationships between the US, Russia, and Iceland, and that the Arctic was a place where we could come together for peace and for peace, peaceful reasons. Um, in 2006, we tried something a little different. Uh, Andy Revkin, most of you read the environment pages in the New York Times, know him as a very prominent environmental writer. And he, he spoke about the climate change story and why it's very difficult to communicate climate change to the general public. He also brought a guitar and sang a couple of songs. Um, so, Tom, did, did you bring your guitar? Uh, actually, I've been paying not to sing. Okay, all right. So we're not doing that this year, but um, th that was a pretty special moment. Um, so the, the memorial lecture was, was established to honor the work, vision, and memory of Willemer Stephenson. Um, he was born in 1879 in an uh, Icelandic community in Manitoba, Canada. Um, he, he traveled extensively throughout the Arctic, largely from the period 1906 to 19. 18 and three major expeditions. He covered more than 20,000 miles in the Arctic. And um, uh, in, in that process, he became one of the first anthropologists to adopt Inuit ways for travel and survival and to really focus on Inuit ways of life and understanding how people became adapted to and thrived in what most people at that time thought was a, a very extreme environment. Um, and, he, he brought back uh, these bold new images of Arctic lands and its people to a largely uninformed but curious public here in, in the United States. And so long before people were talking about climate change and thinking about the wealth of the Arctic, the oil and gas, and, and where to get it, and how to ship it, and how to make money from that, he, he formed his own image of the Arctic. And it was often referred to as the friendly Arctic. Um, Stephenson saw the Arctic as a homeland, a place where people lived, where there were these uniquely adapted cultures that had much to inform our way of life here. And he also emulated the Arctic lifestyle when he came back to Hanover, and there's a lot of interesting writing about that. Um, his, his real contribution to understanding the Arctic is found in 28 books, 400 publications, numerous interviews, lectures. He really was the person that brought the Arctic to the American people. He also brought Stephenson's view of the Arctic to the American people. And, and those of you that have read his writings can understand what I mean here. Um, as many very creative and, and uh, uh, sort of uh, innovative and interesting people, he was also controversial in certain ways in his time. And, and that's made uh, grist for many historians and writers. Uh, he's a fascinating person to learn about in that context. Um, after his expeditions, um, Stevenson came back to the United States. He became a very colorful public uh, intellectual. 
Um, and he became a regular part of the lecture scene. He, he came to Dartmouth starting, I think, in 1939. And he was an occasional lecturer here in the, in the 40s and the 50s, lecturing the men of Dartmouth about the Arctic and, and, and ways of survival in these cold environments. Um, in 1951, that relationship was formalized. He became the Arctic consultant at a college. And he moved up from New York with his very, very extensive library. And um, in, in the time that he was here, he developed the Northern Studies program, which became actually one of the largest majors at Dartmouth College in the 50s. This was really an important part of our, our identity and our legacy here at Dartmouth College. Um, so um, um, in the process of uh, donating his library to Dartmouth College, Dartmouth began to build that. And it's now become, and it's known as the Stephenson Collection in Polar Exploration. And this is really the world's premier collection, primary research materials on the Arctic. Um, it spans from the 1600s up to 1930. And scholars come from all around the world to learn about the history of the Arctic and a view of the Arctic from the past through this amazing academic collection of papers that Stephenson brought to and, and left to the college. Um, let me now share a few words about the other part of Stephenson, a very remarkable woman, his wife, Evelyn Stephenson Neff. Um, Evelyn uh, was born in 1913. She started as a puppeteer with Bill Ballard, who was a very famous person in his own right. And she became a regular fixture in the Greenwich Village scene in New York City. And it, it was there that she met Willemer Stephenson. She had divorced Ballard, and she became Stephenson's research assistant and, and librarian. And um, she also became active in, in writing about the Arctic herself. She accompanied uh, uh, Stephenson to Dartmouth in, 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 in the 50s. And the two of them here became a very prominent feature of the Dartmouth and the Hanover community. Um, this is a time when there were very few women at Dartmouth. And Evelyn was a, a major fixture on the campus. She was uh, in the library. She was lecturing. She lectured for two years in the Arctic Seminar here. So the two of them were, were major figures here at Dartmouth College and really shaped our, our view of, of the Arctic and of Dartmouth as, as a place where prominent people could come. Um, Evelyn passed away in, in 2009. Um, she in, left a, a, a gift to Dartmouth College uh, in honoring Stephenson, but also acknowledging Stephenson's legacy and identity as, as an Icelander and providing an opportunity for the Stephenson Arctic Institute in Iceland and the Dartmouth Institute of Arctic Studies to work more closely together. So I think it's really appropriate today that we're holding this event here in Hanover. We have uh, our, our friends from Iceland are here to celebrate this event. And in particular, they're here to develop new long-range plans about how Dartmouth and Iceland can work together in the future. And Evelyn and Willemer Stephenson are, are really the, the, the impetus and the opportunity and the inspiration for us to work together, hoping to build a more sustainable future for the Arctic. Um, the Stephenson Arctic Institute is directed by Dr. Niels Einersen, um, who you meet in just a second. His co-director, Jan Hocker, is also here as well as Neil's uh, wife, um, Adney Stella, and we've been enjoying your company very much so far. Um, Niels, uh, the director of the Institute, is a social scientist. He's worked on some very prominent research projects. I think the most significant is the Arctic Human Development Report. This was produced when Iceland chaired the uh, Arctic Council. And it's really a sustainable development plan for the Arctic, and it's widely used as the template for much of the new and social science research that's occurring in the Arctic. And Neil's, Neil's stamp is all over that very important document. Um, so um, I've asked Niels to, to come forward and talk a little bit about the Institute at Iceland and to accept the honor of introducing our speaker, uh, Tom McGovern. Niels, welcome back to Dartmouth. Thank you, Ross. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. I was uh, the first Stephens Memorial Lecture we had here in, at Dartmouth was uh, presented by the President of Iceland. I think I'm uh, slightly nervous. I was slightly nervous then, slightly nervous now, and the stern eyes of uh, Wilhelmur there. Uh, but I do want to say a couple of words about the Stephenson Arctic Institute. Uh, it, it's an institute which is uh, obviously named after Stephenson, but uh, 
uh, belongs to the Ministry for the uh, Environment and Natural Resources, uh, and we are the only Arctic Institute in Iceland. We specialize in the Arctic, the uh, northern polar regions. We don't do very much with Antarctica, uh, but we know where it is. Uh, so uh, our our task is to be a, a multidisciplinary institute looking at uh, focusing on human environmental relationships in the Arctic. So we look at governance issues, we look at uh, human development, sustainable development, uh, new resource governance regimes and their social impacts, social and environmental impacts. Uh, we look at uh, marine mammal issues and controversies uh, which are always an important issue for the Arctic. Uh, we look at uh, northern agriculture uh, and uh, human ecological, uh, human ecology uh, uh, processes and, and systems. Uh, and uh, we do a, a great deal of international collaboration. Uh, I, I think our strength is uh, our networking capacity, so to speak. And, uh, Dartmouth College has been from the outset uh, of our uh, startup in 1998 uh, a key a key partner. Uh, so we are extremely happy to to be here and and to uh, participate in this event. Uh, Ross mentioned one of our our uh, claims to fame, which is the Arctic Human Development Report, which is uh, uh, I think something that we can be relatively happy with. Uh, we managed to uh, uh, collect almost 90 social scientists uh, and uh, it was a project that I, I led with uh, Oran Young. It was, uh, Secretariat was at the Stephenson Institute uh, as is the second Arctic Human Development Report which is being led by our, uh, uh, our colleague Dr. Johan Neumann Larsen uh, who is uh, not here today, but uh, <coughs> uh, we have uh, we have also participated in a, a number of uh, uh, international projects. Uh, I also want to mention that we are uh, the only Icelandic institute, and, and I, I, I use this to boast a little bit, that is uh, involved in leading a, uh, a chapter in the upcoming IPCC report on the polar regions, uh, which will be uh, an extremely important uh, contribution to our, our ways of understanding adaptation and mitigation of climate change in the Arctic regions and polar regions. Um, I also want to mention that uh, we have, uh, as to honor the legacy of Stefansson, uh, the, the colorful personality <laughs> of Stephenson. Uh, we have an, uh, an uh, exhibit called the Friendly Arctic, which we have taken to uh, many countries around the world, uh, including uh, <coughs> Scandinavia House on Manhattan and uh, Nook in Greenland. Uh, and it is a, a collaborative project uh, that we share with Dartmouth College. Uh, now, I think I see that uh, Professor McGovern is getting a slightly impatient. So, so with, without any, any further <laughs> talk, I would like to introduce Professor McGovern. Uh, Professor McGovern is uh, an anthropologist, an archaeologist, uh, who has done extensive field work around the world uh, for, and has a career ranging for almost 40 years, which is a long time. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, uh, I also want to mention that he is uh, one of the founders of the North Atlantic Biocultural Organization, which was uh, initiated with NSF support in 1992 and has done remarkable things in terms of uh, uh, international research, outreach and education uh, on sort of historical human ecology. Uh, in Iceland, in Greenland, in, in various places, uh, and, and it's, a, it's a wonderful organization which uh, we at the Stephenson Institute, especially my colleague Jon Höcker, have been associated with for, for quite some time. Um, um, I also want to mention that uh, 
uh, McGovern is is uh, is uh, uh, responsible for has worked with uh, the uh, Global Human Ecodynamics Eco Alliance, which has uh, attracted a, a great international uh, interest, uh, and uh, and uh, indeed. Uh, among other things, together with NAPO, has been recognized by the American Anthropological Association uh, with the Gordon Willey Memorial Prize for Outstanding Interdisciplinary Archaeology. Now he is uh, also, McGovern is also Associate Director of the Human Dynamics Research Center at the, the City University of New York Graduate Center, and he has served on various uh, distinguished uh, uh, panels on Arctic and multidisciplinary research. Um, the wor word is yours, Professor McGovern. Thank you very much. Thank you, Niels. I, um, I scarcely recognize that person just introduced, but I'll try to do the best anyway that I can to um, tell you some things we've been doing these past years in the North Atlantic region. I'd also like to thank Dartmouth and I'd like to thank the Arctic Center here for um, inviting me here to this beautiful campus. I worked with people from Dartmouth through virtually my whole career, but this is my first chance to come to campus and it's beautiful. Thank you. Okay, I think next thing is just to go ahead and... Oh, wow. Right. NABO, as we pronounce it, is a clever acronym, or it tries to be. In many Scandinavian languages, it means neighbor. And the idea behind it was, when we founded it 20-some um, odd years ago, was to try to do collectively things we can't do as individual scholars, as individual research teams, even as entire national efforts. So there's been a lot of partnership in this. As you can see from sort of looking at the slide here, we've been doing lots of stuff for a long time and pooling resources, helping train students, doing outreach. It's been tons of fun, as well as I think very productive for all of us. Uh, I'm also like to say how grateful we all are for Jon Hoker, for Niels, the Stephenson Institute, and hosting our latest group meeting in Akureyri this past summer, which was one of our, our biggest ever, and I think actually really one of our best as well. So, so thank you very much. If you'd like to know a lot more than you probably want to know about us, look at our website and there's tons more there. Okay, what I'm gonna to speak to you about tonight is this portion of the Northern Circumpolar World, the North Atlantic. And a lot of the story here is really in those blue and red current lines you see there. The North Atlantic drift, extension of the Gulf Stream, washing up through Europe, through Arctic Norway, warming the European side of this area, and then the blue currents coming down the other way, cooling the western portion of the North Atlantic. What this means is, is that a colonist coming from above the Arctic Circle, from Tromsø, say, in Norway, where there's still deciduous trees on the coast, could come to Iceland, hundreds of kilometers south, and yet go to a more Arctic area. And similarly, his son or grandson or granddaughter could go to South Greenland and traveling somewhat south and somewhat west cross over a real Arctic boundary. So part of our story here is about biogeography and current circulation and about climate change and about new findings. So we have a lot of new things to talk about tonight. There's a huge amount of new research being done and I can, I can talk it up because almost none of it's mine. I'm reporting other people's work, but that's my job. Okay, so one new finding is we have a new dating for the pharaohs. Just this past month, we have a publication out uh, demonstrating that there were, in fact, people on the pharaohs farming the place, um, charring barley by accident, as early as 600 AD, a full 200 years or more before the Norse were supposed to have gotten there. So the, the story of Dikuil, that there were these places north of Britain that were inhabited by monks and others who were driven away by the pagan Norse, seems to have been dead on. And now, with multiple grains of barley, that thanks to multiple modern science, we can date these individual little bits by radiocarbon. We can def definitely demonstrate that. So an old map, but some new things happening on it. 
Okay, so what we're doing then as a strategy is trying to bring together as many different strands of evidence, as much different expertise to these big problems of how do people colonize Australians? And having done so, why do some islands go down pathways that lead to long-term sustainability as an Iceland, and others go down pathways which eventually lead to the worst possible outcome, complete biological and cultural extinction, as in Greenland? So I'm an, actually an archaeologist. I'm, in fact, a zooarchaeologist. So the fact that there's a dead sheep in this picture makes me very excited. Um, and this is Jim Willett, who's my good friend and colleague, who is now a professor at University of Laval in Quebec and one of our good collaborators. We are very international. But we also realize that this is a place of literacy, that we are teetering in the edge of prehistory uh, as we go out into the North Atlantic with the Vikings. And the Icelanders are famous. Notice the background of that picture for literacy, for writing things down. And not only about themselves, without Icelandic scholarship in the Middle Ages, there would be really no effective history of Norway before about 1100 either. So the Icelanders have been producing more literature than their own island can comfortably contain for many, many years. So it, this is a major source. Now, of course, like the archaeology, the documentary sources require specialist training and specialist handling. They're not easy things to work with. And in most cases, they are visions of a past by later people. So we, as a strategy in NABO, get by with help from our friends, with our neighbors. The idea is to not have us try to do a bad translation of sagas, to bring on Icelanders who do excellent translations of sagas and actually have a clear consciousness of all the scholarship that's built up around them. So the idea here is to bring the person, the skills, with the data set. And yep, that's for natural science as well. These stripes you see in the dirt here are volcanic tephra, ash layers that fall across Iceland, average about once every 10 years or so. It may not be much fun to be under them, but by golly, they're helpful for archaeology because they help us to date things precisely across wide areas. And then we have heroic collaborators like Andy Dugmore here, and I promised I would pick this picture of him up there. In fact, I threatened to. Um, because he's one of my best friends, and we have worked together for a long time. As you can see here, he's heroically pointing the way forward into glaciology. So we bring forward lots of different things at the same time. So to set the stage, let's talk a little bit about some of the new findings, the new understandings that broadly connect together this region before focusing in on Iceland and Greenland with these two stories about long-term sustainability and about painful transition collapse. Well, one big finding of the recent years is about kinship. And it is very clear, both from analysis of the DNA of living people in the North Atlantic and increasingly from the ancient DNA recovered from the bones of their ancestors from excavations, that the people who went out into the North Atlantic in the Viking Age were not all Scandinavian. Indeed, there was a very strong Celtic component here. 65% of women in Iceland, 85% in the Faroes were of British Isles, North Celtic ancestry. Now this, of course, confirms what every Icelander has known in his heart or her heart for years and years, that they all, without exception, descended from a Norwegian Jarl and an Irish princess. No one came over in steerage. This is also, of course, their explanation for why Icelanders are so much more fluent and so much more literate than their stick-in-the-mud Norwegian relatives is that Blarney in there. So you have then this sense that this is, in many important ways, a, a joint effort. Although the language and the dominant culture is certainly Nordic, there's lots of pieces of this mixture that goes out there, such as building and turf, uh, techniques for hunting seals, um, techniques for burning fuel that are definitely Celtic rather than Nordic. So this is a, a mixed community culturally as well as biologically that goes out into the North Atlantic when they do. And then, of course, part of our story here is unintended consequences. Nobody intended to bring these little guys along, but they did. In fact, you'll be glad to know that your tax dollars have generated the third largest collection of fleas and human body lice ever made anywhere from any archaeological group. Uh, the, the first is the Egyptians still win. Coming after that are the Peruvians, but we're number three. Uh, and you can see there's a nice quote there from Dick Will explaining about latitude uh, in a particular way there. So although the Norse were explorers and went to all sorts of strange and new places, they were never entirely alone. 
<laughs> OK, so we have then some other things to look at. I'm afraid I will inflict some graphs and charts upon you, but it's part of the story. Part of the wonderful riches which we as social scientists have to work with is the, the contributions of the hard scientists, the climatologists, in giving us climate data about the North Atlantic region that is on the human scale of years and seasons. I'm old enough to remember that when we were given blocks of time, for 300 years, every day was sunshine. And for another 300 years, every day was bitter cold. And of course, that's not how things work. So here we can look at some variability. <coughs> and in the bottom here, you're seeing a multi-proxy for climate change, for temperature change in the North Atlantic region. It's a little outdated, but it's good enough to make our points here. Now, how do people experience climate change? That's a pretty good question even for today. How does climate change affect your ability to get through your life, to survive the future, to reproduce successfully, to have your culture go on? How do you make that happen? And then as now, a lot of it has to do with your experience of prior climate change. What tools are in your box of knowledge you can bring out when things change? And that brings us to this upper register, which is Andy Dugmore's work. What Andy's done is put a, a smoothing filter of 15 years across the data below. And what he's doing here is he's flagging up years in which it is different from the previous 15 years. So for example, if we have a look along here, something jumps right out here, doesn't it? We have a block of time here where not only is it getting colder, but it's getting more variable, and the variability in both directions is far outside living memory, in fact, dead memory as well. So one of the questions then, as we're looking at these different cases of success and failure in the North Atlantic, is where do stress points come on human cultures? And of course, the broader question, what relevance does this have for the present and future, comes back to this as well. We'll come back to more graphs like this, but before we leave this one, let's look at this one here. This is a sea salt sodium proxy for storminess. Another thing you notice here is a bit after this initial wiggle of cooling, comes another trend of storminess change. I will not say that the North Atlantic, the Eric, the Red Sailed was a glass smooth duck pond, but it was close to that compared to the North Atlantic that we have experienced since 1425, which is when the flip over takes place. So think about this climate data in the background of what we're talking about, and we'll come back to that in more detail. Now the other thing to think about is not about changing climate, but about human history about things coming together, conjunctures on different scales. Far away from the North North Atlantic, in the high Middle Ages, in the 1200s, things happen. This cheerful looking gentleman up there uh, conquers much of Central and Eastern and Western Asia. This is the Mongol age. And this is this extent which connects up East Asia, South Asia, Near East, and Europe in a network which previously never existed. And which many historians now have argued this Pax Mongolica was a precursor for the post-1500 world system in many important respects. And the inset there, there's Marco Polo and his uncle getting a safe conduct from the great Khan to go back to Genoa, which they do by sea, having got there by land, which tells you something about connections. So how about the North Atlantic? Are there market echoes? of the Pax Mongolica out in the North Atlantic after the 1200s, specifically in things like dried fish and high quality woolens. And we'll come back to these questions as well. But let's think about these conjunctures between climate and human history and markets, because of course that's still happening, isn't it? Okay, so back to our question. Lan Nam in Iceland, first settlement, land taking. It's dated pretty well to about 872 plus or minus one. The settlement areas are talked about in the sagas, which have been well documented by the archaeology or the north and the south. But our, our data suggests that people spread very rapidly across Iceland. Um, and the settlers are a mix of different kinds of people coming together and very rapidly filling up the habitable parts of the island. Here's a new question. The sagas talk about farming and about land. But a new question is, was it really about walrus hunting? How do you get somebody, or as my good friend Adolf Dixon says, how do you convince your wife to pack up everything, put it in a boat, and go to Iceland where there's not even a travel brochure out? 
You know, somebody has had to have gotten there first, explored the place, brought back ideas, brought back knowledge of the new land, and they have to be going there for a reason. And we're suspecting that one of the reasons is hunting for this high value Arctic treasure, walrus ivory, and of course the walrus hide, which was made into high quality ropes. We think that because we actually have evidence of Icelandic walrus hunting now, which you did not have before. That's a walrus tusk, I bet you could tell that already. And it comes from underneath the bench in a Viking Age hall under modern Reykjavik. How many times have you left an apartment and failed to look under the bed, failed to clean out that last drawer? Well, they did that here, and there's three tusks were left behind. Maybe intentionally, maybe not. And down here, we have a concentration of walrus place names in the south. And in the excavations around the site of Adelstraithi, which is right under modern Reykjavik, there's a nice little museum right on top of it. Go to there if you go to Reykjavik, check it all out. And you'll see that there's walrus bones been found in area around there, including the bones of immature walrus who can't swim very well. And therefore, we know for sure there were walrus colonies there. We have an ancient DNA project on walrus working right now, which in a few months will probably tell us even more about extinct Icelandic walrus populations. Okay, so there were, were walrus in Iceland, but the population, this natural capital, seems to have been drawn down and expended within the first hundred years or so of settlement. And of course, ultimately, that's not the only resource drawn down and expended in Iceland. In this picture, you're going to have to trust me, there is an iron smelter, there are multiple charcoal pits, in the distance, there's actually a full-scale farm, all of which were in operation in the Viking Age. And as you can see now, it's all roted down to glacial till. Not too far from where this picture was taken, in the 1960s, Apollo astronauts trained in Iceland because they thought it was the most desolate part of the world you could go to that was most like the surface of the moon. And the places they trained on once had not only grass and soil, but trees. So this is in part an anthropogenic landscape created by humans, and as we'll see, it's a complex issue. Okay, so we have then this question about extensive landscape degradation occurring in Iceland. It starts with deforestation. This is a reconstruction of what we think Icelandic woodlands looked like at settlement, about 27% of the total land surface. And that's what they look like now. <coughs> That's also what they looked like around 1100 AD, which is interesting because they didn't go to zero. And between 1100 and near present, they also didn't reduce that much either. They're being managed at a certain level. So what's woodland good for in Iceland? These are little twisty trunks sort of things. They're not big timbers you're talking about. <coughs> this is stuff that's mostly useful for charcoal smelting, for iron smithing. So what you may be seeing here is things being reduced down to the point where this is about as much woodland as you need for charcoal smelting, and that's as far as you need it. After all, a treeless landscape that's covered with grass is actually a better landscape for farmers who are grazing animals than a dense woodland is going to be. So is this an ecological disaster or a landscape fit for purpose? Okay, you may have noticed some areas where there's not much green. That's where the blue arrows come in. Those are major areas of driftwood coming in. So the areas that have complete deforestation have alternate sources, potentially of fuel. So there's lots of different ways of looking at deforestation in Iceland. And then, of course, there's a question about changing the mix of animals. Pigs are very good at destroying landscape. Everybody knows that. If you Google for swine infestation, you will see this. Um, we now know, actually, from ancient DNA studies on Greenland, on, on Faroese and now Icelandic pigs, that actually these, these wild boars are not a good model. They were actually about that tall, they were black with white spots, and they probably had a bad disposition. And we know that all from their, their, their DNA now. Science is wonderful, I love it. But from my part of the science, which is the zooarchaeology, we can see that pig bones decline through time. That's the red bar there. So what you're seeing here is that as time progresses and as Iceland becomes deforested, the mix changes and pigs and goats are removed from the mix of animals. So again, we're not seeing farmers who are inflexible, who are incapable of changing, who are prisoners of culture to some extent. What you're seeing here is people like ourselves who are capable of assessing a problem and making some changes, and they do. And pigs become extinct. And that's why we have to reconstruct them from their DNA. Okay, the other thing that just comes out of the soil science done by our good friends and colleagues from Sterling University, I've been talking to some good soil scientists here while I've been visiting, 
is that it's possible to demonstrate the Norse are actually manuring soils fairly heavily. We can even see where some of the sources of their manure are coming from. So soil formation, soil amendment, soil creation is very much part of the story in Iceland as well. So this isn't just a story of heedless Vikings drawing down a scarce natural resource. This is a much more complicated story of people fertilizing, of amending soil, of intending things to last for a very long time. And of course, some parts of Iceland are very green to this day, so it worked. Okay, we have some other stories about sustainability to talk about. The longer you look at this picture, the worse it gets. All those dots are black flies, every single one of them. Need I say more? These are brave men up there in Iceland who work there. Um, but it's really all about not flies, but a whole ecosystem. The flies are feeding trout and ducks, and the ducks come to Iceland, to this part of Iceland, Nivan, which means Midge Lake in northern Iceland, from both hemispheres, the only part in the world where it does. Some 30,000 pairs come to breed there every year. It's a World Heritage Site. And every year to this day, Icelandic farmers around the, the lake take as many as 10,000 eggs a year. But they do it sustainably because they only take one or two eggs per nest and they don't kill the adults. And we know from records and traveler's tales that this has gone back to like the 1850s. And the question is how far back further has this gone? This is where the archaeology comes in. Because that's a picture of crushed eggshells, an archaeological surface. That's in fact right on the Lan Nam Tefra of 870 AD. So we've got lots of these. And it turns out that you can identify them by looking at them and scanning electron microscope. And a big project, as we speak, is now going on to expand our capacity to do this collaboratively with our Icelandic colleagues in the University of Iceland, scanning electron microscopes, humming as we speak. And the results are very clear that we have duck eggs, some ptarmigan eggs, and a few seabird eggs. We're 60 kilometers from the coast now. A few seabird eggs preserved here in large quantities from the very first settlement in Iceland onwards. And what we don't have is the bones of the ducks. We have bones of birds, all right, but they're all ptarmigan. You know, the local grouse, not the migratory waterfowl. So what we have here is a millennial scale story of successful management of a very fragile resource. Remember, all they have to do is kill the adults and take all the eggs. Pretty soon there's no more birds. So the reason that there is a World Heritage Site in Mivatan today is the result of long-term human action and bottom up. In the 870s, there was no centralized state anywhere in Scandinavia to inf in enforce regulations anywhere. So we are working now with our Icelandic colleagues, with ethnographers, with the local population. We're very eager to have the story get out, by the way, um, to document this more fully, because there's a lot more TEK, traditional ecological knowledge, behind this than the, the summary I've given you. OK, so we also have other animals found inland a whole bunch of marine mammals in bits and pieces who are now being ancient dna as well. We have another project going with the whales. And here we have all these pieces of marine animal 60, 70 kilometers from the coast. Something is going on here. They're community scale exchanges, and it's big, part of a bigger story. Okay, what's our bigger story? Our bigger story is that we are having connections in early Iceland, economic connections between coast and inland that are in many different parts of Iceland. Uh, the biggest story is where we've been doing most of our collective work up in the Mivatan area, but other inland sites are also showing bones of sea creatures, sea mammals, but especially marine fish. Okay, so it's not the whole fish that's coming inland. If you look at that schematic drawing of a cod there, the pieces we find on the inland uh, sites are all the red ones and not the yellow ones. So what's missing? Heads. The very sort of thing you throw away at the coastal fishing site and the pieces you bring in is not the whole vertebral column either, it's just pieces of it. We're pretty sure of how they're butchering it. And the pieces that are coming in that are close to the head is that little red bit by the gill slit. That's the clathrum. The clathrum in a haddock popular fish for Icelanders now and then, is dense enough you can carve things out of it. And here you see a little chess piece, a Islamic styled chess piece, indicating contact with the Islamic world, probably very indirectly, dating to about 1200 from Iceland. We'll keep coming back to that 1200 connection later on. Okay, but we have a bigger question about the codfish story. Where did it come from? Now codfish 
dried cod as a product became one of the very first products in the medieval world to be standardized, to be commoditized, to be turned from a natural product into something which could be a line on entry books, it could be traded without anybody seeing it miles away. People would lend money on fish futures, they would not lend on grain. And I know that's very commonplace, we do that all today, but this was the first thing that medieval people were willing to do this on. So if you've all lost a bundle of stock market recently, blame codfish, or made it, enjoy the codfish. So one question really is, who started this? So we have a bunch of collective unanswered questions. Clearly, where does North Atlantic commercial fishing come from? But probably more relevantly, more specifically, where does the deep sea fishing and fish preserving techniques come from before we know about them historically, around 1100? Because the dried fish, which becomes so important in Europe after 1100, is this really amazing product. It's air dried, it's not salt, salted, and it can last for up to seven years. Uh, it has the downside of having con of a texture, which Iceland will forgive me, which is much like eating wallboard. They have many, many different recipes which make the wallboard delicious, and I don't want to offend them any further than I have just done, but, but there's trade-offs here. But think about that wallboard. That is incredibly pure protein stuff. It's the best thing in the world you can get, eat, and it lasts without refrigeration for all this time. What can't you do with it? Lots and lots of things. Now, in other parts of Europe, before about 950 to 1050, this is unknown. And our friend James Barrett, who's doing a very careful uh, analysis of all these Anglo-Saxon other bone collections, has demonstrated something he calls a fish event horizon, which occurs somewhere around the year 1000, which he brackets by 50 years on each side. And after this point, you start getting all these headless fish turning up miles and miles from the coast. Where did this come from? I think you can see we know the answer. The Vikings did it. So we have evidence of a fish trade inland to Miva, <coughs> which predates the fish event horizon in Britain and the rest of, Scan and the rest of Europe by about 100 years or so. So we know where it comes from. And if you'll bear with me for a few more bar graphs, we can sort of see a few more things about it. Now don't worry about the, all the different bars here. Just think about the patterns. This is in Iron Age Norway and Viking Age Iceland. There's a wide range of fish are used. So this is your artisanal fish processing. People are catching whatever comes over the rail. They're processing in their own different way. You probably get it by going down to the shore and bickering with, with uh, Olaf there, and you are going to get Olaf's fish, not somebody else's fish. So it's probably all very embedded in those kinds of personal relationships which take place in a non-monetary economy. And then something changes. The blue is all cod. So both in northern Norway and in Iceland, with commoditization, with commercialization, comes standardization. So now it's all about producing a standardized product that can be bought and sold. You don't have to know Olaf. You're buying a certain grade of fish from a lot of Olafs and they can be shipped about. And again, it's the sort of thing we take for granted in our own lives, but here it's starting up and we can see it in the archaeology. Okay, just a few more of these. Um, body parts. The yellow is heads and jaws, and the blue is bodies. No prize. These are inland consumer sites with all the blue. It's all tails. And those are the producer sites, lots of heads. But one thing to also notice is the haddock over there and the cod in the middle are being processed somewhat differently. We can begin using the zooarchaeology to pull out some subtleties in how fish are getting butchered. Um, the haddock, sorry, that are being uh, prepared and also eaten on site. Icelanders still to this day prefer haddock to cod, and fishermen are feeding themselves out of their own catch. So we're seeing this taking place in these coastal sites as well. And then there's somebody different. This one isn't cutting his fish the way the other guys are doing. He's not with the program. He's also early. He's Viking Age. So we're beginning to get the sense that we can actually see changes on this sort of level of detail in how people are processing fish in Iceland. And we can see the onset of commercialization, standardization, and it's happening right around 1200, 1250 AD. Notice that conjuncture. Now, I could talk about fish bones for the rest of the evening, but you may be glad to think that I'm not going to do that. OK, those are the products, flat dried, round dried. Just one more slide. I'm sure I can stop anytime. 
because we've, of course, put lots of effort into this, we can tell you the difference between different products being produced from the size of the fish that are being harvested. We can reconstruct the size of the fish and measurement of the bones. And we can, of course, contribute to fishery science through doing this. And yes, we have another ancient DNA project going with our friends who are looking at codfish in Iceland. And we can talk about population changes there as well. Good fun. OK, but let's get back to that issue about Iceland's soils blowing away, about overgrazing. How does that happen? Uh, how is that not part of the old story of a heedless use of natural resources? To address this one, let's look, take a look at sheep's natural cycle. They start out wintertime down here in lower elevations. And in the summertime, in the spring, some of them move up into the nearby hinterlands to the shielding rangelands for milking. And this is where the part of the flock that's being managed for milk is going. Now, the part of the flock that's not being managed for milk, that is being managed instead for wool and later for meat, isn't being kept so close because you don't have to milk them. Instead, what's happening is you're being taken up further into higher elevations into the communal rangelands, and there they're wandering around loose. Now, you may ask yourself, environmentally, where's the trouble going to start? Pretty clearly, it's up in the communal rangelands where there's nobody watching them. What's happening in the rangelands? Well, this is a modeling issue. Uh, a model put together by our friends in Sterling called Boo Model suggests very strongly that there's actually plenty of grazing up in the higher elevations for any imaginable number of stock. The problem comes not so much in total number of sheep, but how long you keep them up there. If you keep them up in the highlands past the end of growing season, by even a short period of time, you start killing the grass. You start opening holes in the grass cover. You start these erosion fronts moving, and that's when things go badly, badly wrong. So it's a question of timing rather than simply a question of too many sheep on the land. So we have another model put together by Andy Casely, which is doing modeling on a very fine scale, 250 meters on the side. And what he's doing is he's looking at a whole variety of seasonal indicators, in this case, and the growing season. So in this particular chart, there's Lake Nevot in the middle, and the squares around the grazing areas <coughs> that we're pretty sure are being used by the people in Nevot for their sheep. So the purple is the end of growing season in August, and the white is September. So in the modern temperature zone, you're perfectly OK keeping the sheep up there until September is in the white areas. Life is good. But let's drop the temperature to only 1.5 degrees centigrade and see what happens and see all the extra purple. These are all areas which will be impacted if you keep the sheep up in there even an extra week. So you can see the problem of a very small fluctuation in terms of temperature can have a real impact geographically on the areas where it's safe to go on grazing versus ones that's not. So what if you play it safe and bring them on always early? Well, then you're setting yourself for another problem because, of course, the sheep are going to have to eat somewhere. So where they're eating is on their winter pastures, which you're going to need for later on in the winter. So it's always a, a game. It's always a problem. Farmers do not lead timeless lives. They lead very scheduled lives and over less than Iceland. OK, so we have a situation then where too long in the highlands with too many sheep could be a problem. What are the Icelanders doing around 1,200 with their sheep? Well, in this graph, a tall bar is more sheep versus cows. And what you're seeing here is in the Viking Age and the early medieval period, uh, you know, you've got one cow, two sheep, three sheep, five sheep. And then suddenly around 1,200, it goes about one cow to 25 sheep, which is about where you are in the Mivatan area in 1712 when they do the first stock census. So what we're seeing here is an increase in the relative proportions of sheep, and also, not in this graph, you have to trust me for this one, this is when they are all sheep, they're not half goats. In the Viking period, the flocks are about half goats, which don't produce wool. In this period, after 1,200, they're all sheep producing wool. So what are we doing here? Looks like wool production. OK, now background again, another climate wiggle. It would be easy to fault the Icelanders for triggering a crazy disaster by getting their timing wrong, by overstocking, by over pushing that, that sheep wool production area. Except you think about the exact time frames in which they're doing it, are sort of in there. 
This is the cumulative differences between different, different successive years. And you can see there's a tendency for things to get warmer overall in the North Atlantic right up to about 985, and it gets cooler afterwards. The periods of, of rapid cooling are pretty easy to figure out. It's bad news. Every year is worse than the last one. But what do you do with the errors when it's in between? We get these jaggedy things. How do you figure that out? Especially, of course, if you lack the kind of long-term temperature record which we have, and they didn't. So figure that out. Are these the high stress period for farmers, for their decision making? We are suspect that is the case. So then, what are the managers thinking in these critical juncture points? Are they thinking about their environment? Are they thinking about how to make it sustainable? Are they thinking about the long term? Or are they distracted? Well, they're distracted. The Icelandic elites about this point are having, having a civil war. They've gotten five great families together and they've, they've sort of centralized things a bit. And there's some wonderful, wonderful saga stories about the feuds and they're all contemporary and they're really great reading, but it doesn't end well. Uh, Iceland, everybody loses, uh, arguably environment too, and Iceland becomes part of the Norwegian kingdom. Again, note the dates, 1264. So, question, were they getting it wrong by a week? You know, how, how close a miss was this to getting it right? And again, remember that, in fact, most of Iceland remains green. Only parts of Iceland wind up with an erosion disaster. So is this a situation where a whole bunch of things are coming together at once? Not the least, the kind of fluctuation, the kind of variability that makes it very hard to use past experience, traditional knowledge, to predict the future. So at one time, TEK, traditional ecological knowledge, was all knowledge. It's what farmers had, it's what hunters had, it's everybody had to, to manage their lives. And under what circumstances will this be challenged and be defeated by climate change or by other conjunctures coming together? And this gets to be a key question that we're all looking at. Okay, so time in TEK. If we look at our time periods here as blocks, <coughs> Between settlement and 1270, in Iceland, they had about 25 human generations. In Greenland, 18. That's a long time. You, know, you figure after 25 generations, you could be forgiven for thinking you had everything figured out pretty well, that you really knew what the boundaries were, what you'd get away with. How many more sheep could I stick up there and still have things work? And you figure you know the answer to that pretty well. And then in 1258, a gigantic volcano blows up in what's now Indonesia and puts a vast amount of dust in the atmosphere and triggers sea ice formation north of Iceland. And according to many, is a trigger for the beginning of the Little Ice Age. Who could see that one coming? Nobody, including us. So sudden stepwise change, that's where all those wiggles come from in terms of your, your TEK. So who could see that one coming? Not them, not us. Okay. So, moving onwards, we have an interesting, complicated story of Iceland surviving a whole bunch of different things, sustainable in the ducks, not so sustainable in the soils, but a near miss on soils. What about Greenland? Iceland, after all, pulls through. Bad things go on happening. Smallpox come to Iceland. A third of them die. Volcanic eruptions happen. More of them die. Famines happen. And yes, they're still there and still literate and still writing things down. And Iceland today ranks as one of the best, top five best places to live in the whole world. Pretty good outcome long term. Tough getting there. But in Greenland, different story. Worst possible outcome. By 1450 or so, they're all gone. So looking at Norse Greenland then, it settled around 985, or just over 100 and some odd years after the Icelandic settlement. There are two major settlement areas, confusingly enough, called the Western Settlement and the Eastern Settlement. It's confusing because they're in fact both on the western side of the island. For the north, there's an area called the North Sater, Northern Hunting Grounds, and this is where walrus were being hunted and also furs. Okay, walrus, a big deal in Iceland a far bigger deal in Greenland. We think that a very major reason for Greenland being settled from Iceland was probably to pursue those walrus. And the people who had been hunting walrus successfully in 
Iceland went on hunting them in Greenland. And indeed, Greenland's economy, from the beginning to the end, was very largely tied up with this walrus hunt, this Nordrasater hunt. When I wrote my dissertation, an embarrassing long time ago, uh, I wrote this up as these Greenlanders were farmers who dabbled in walrus hunting to bring in foreign exchange. So that farming was the big thing and walrus hunting was the hobby. And I got it precisely wrong. It's a good thing they can't make you a PhD back. So we now think that this is really much more like the sort of northern resource extraction colony, which became very common in the later Middle Ages and early modern period, where instead these are walrus hunters who are being supported by farming and hunting elsewhere. It's a big deal for them. They are going 800 kilometers north of their settlements every year, two weeks each way, to hunt walrus and bring back meat? Nope. To bring back a specialized butchery unit of right around the tusks. What they're doing is they're bringing back the tusks, very valuable, and the maxilla, the tusk root, because if you try to pull it out from a, a recently dead walrus, it breaks off the gum line, you lose all the best stuff. You have to bring it back this way, let it rot up a bit, tease out the tusks, that's what they did. So virtually every farm in the eastern western settlements, 800 to 900 kilometers further south, has fragments of walrus maxilla chiseled out, fragments found there. People are taking these things home and they're working on in the wintertime and then what happens to the ivory? We have almost no tusk ivory in Greenland. But we have records of up to 600 kilos of walrus ivory winding up being shipped to Europe and in this case being used to, to pay debts to the papal court. We don't know if that was one year, five years, but it comes out to be a lot. So Greenlanders are sending ivory to Europe. They're sending the, the line made from the rope. They're probably sending furs as well. Um, these are low bulk, high value products. These are the kinds of prestige good products which were typical of Viking Age exchange. You know, you give people expensive gifts and they have to like you. So we have that kind of good. Contrast that with dull things like wool, dried fish, really bulky. You know, no one's going to win someone's heart by giving them a dried fish, <laughs> unless you're hungry. So we have then a really different product being produced here, and that's again something to think about. Now another big difference between Greenland and Iceland was biogeography and the presence of these cute little guys, you know, those Greenpeace seals, harp seals, <laughs> so, so, so cute, so culpable, and so common. There were millions of them, and as there are still today. In the eastern North Atlantic, there's plenty of seals, but they tend to be non-migratory seals, like harbor seals, gray seals, and as a result, if you overexploit those colonies, they'll go. They're either kind of locally extinct or they won't breed there anymore, so they're fragile. And we know from Icelandic law codes that those seal colonies, the non-migratory seals, were owned property that people managed very carefully. So the fact that you still have harbor seal colonies in Iceland is again an indication of long-term sustainable management of a fragile resource. But when you get to Greenland and you get into this major flow of these seals annually in their millions coming up the coast of Greenland, you have this, this huge resource which could be exploited, and it was. Now, how it was exploited? As you can see in the slides, one of the things we're noticing is they're not making harpoons. Or if they are, they're not making very many of them, and they're certainly not the way that the, the Greenlanders use harpoons later, the Inuit Greenlanders. They're probably hunting with boat drives like the Faroese do today with pilot whales, with nets, boats, communally. It doesn't mean that they aren't taking a lot of seals, but it means that they're not taking the seals, the Arctic seals, that are present in Greenland, who are non-migratory, who make breathing holes, like the bearded seal and the ring seal, and that's going to be an important part of the story too. But for now, millions of harp seals, and they can get them, and they do. Now by the 14th century, some of the archaeofauna, the bone collections, are almost all seals. This little guy with the, the arrow here, that's a small, poor farmer. We're pretty sure he is. And boy, he's barely a farmer, isn't he? 80% or more of the bones in that collection are seal bones. So we have then in the zooarchaeology indication that seals are more important in Greenland than they are anywhere else in the North Atlantic. And from our datable layers, that happens right in the first years of settlements happens right away and it continues down to the end, in fact, intensifies. Okay, and then 
Then there's hierarchy. There's religion. The Icelanders c convert to Christianity around the year 1000, and the Greenlanders were either Christians when they got there, or they got Christian pretty soon thereafter. And then they got prosperous. All this is working pretty well. This whole seals and ivory thing is, caribou thing is working pretty well. So the farmers in 1127 get together and they decide that they can afford a bishop. So a wonderful story, Einar Salkinson's story, reports that the farmers got together and elected a, uh, some volunteers to take a live polar bear in an open boat across the Atlantic to Norway. It doesn't say that they all made it, but the polar bear did. <laughs> And the polar bear shows up at the king's court, and they let it be known that the polar bear could be a present if the king could see his way clear to give them a bishop in return. And the king looks around the court, notices he has several prelates, no polar bear, says, you're going. And that was Bishop Arnold, and the story is he was not pleased to go. Uh, but he adjusts. And at the end of the story, the bishop has managed to get all of the leading farmers killed in a feud, and the last one gasps out his desire to give him for the sake of his soul, the manor farm at Gardar, Igaliko in Greenland. And if you believe literally that story, I have a bridge to sell you in Brooklyn, but it's close. So how did it work out for the bishop? Well, if we look at floor areas, see, those are chieftain farms, floor areas for buyers and barns, major farm areas, and that's the chieftain's farm. So as I say, they say, you do the math. Uh, this wound up being by far the most powerful farm in all of Greenland, and certainly the bishop and the bishop's successors uh, had a major role to play. We have one surviving document that, that lists out the uh, church properties and some of the royal properties in Greenland around between 1266, and, uh, between 1320 and 1366. And um, in the eastern settlement, it shows that somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of the total land area was property of the church and the church had rights on many other pieces. Now this is, is more than the percentage would be in Norway, even though in Norway the church also had heavy earnings, ownings at that point. So there's you know, some questions about hierarchy and about control. Specifically, one of the resources that the church controlled was <coughs> reindeer, caribou, in Greenland. Uh, there's an island called Renu in, uh, in Norse, and in Tuktotok in, in Kalatli, and both it means reindeer island and that was property of the church. And we have from excavations, which we just did last summer, animal bones from the bishop's manor, and yes, they're full of caribou bones. More is coming on that, we're still working on that one. So we have then some things happening with churches as both symbols of power and the actual power. And one of the things that we can see now through work done by our good colleagues, uh, Yetta Arneborg, Christian koch Madsen from uh, the National Museum of in Copenhagen, uh, is we can actually see changes in the size and numbers of churches through time. Initially, there's a whole bunch of small churches spread all over the place. Almost every <coughs> medium-sized to large-sized farm has got a church and a small churchyard. And then they get bigger and fewer. And one question is, is this suggesting uh, the absence, the growing absence, of a middle class of farmer in Greenland, which is present in Iceland. This is a graph prepared by Ordi Vestensen, one of our good friends from Iceland. And you can see what he's doing is he's comparing northwestern Iceland, which is the part of Iceland arguably most similar to Greenland, to the eastern settlement in Greenland. And the purple there is the chapels and annexes. Those are the, the surviving small-scale local farm chapels, not parish churches. And you can see there turns out to be proportionally a lot more of them in Iceland than in Greenland. So Iceland and Greenland are becoming different places. They are initially settled by the same people identically genetically, but you can see them diverging. You can see different pathways. One pathway, of course, is in how you make your living, seals versus codfish. Another one may be in governance. You hear a lot about governance today in the Arctic. Governance is a problem in the medieval Arctic as well, and we suspect that there are some growing changes in governance between Iceland and Greenland in the Middle Ages. Okay, here's a slide from Yetta. And this, in the foreground, this little circle of stones is one of the smaller earlier churches, E64. Uh, and the distance is E66, which is a bigger church, which survives down to the end of the settlement. This one is only in the Viking period. And as Yetta says, it seems to be the victim of a hostile takeover. 
That is to say, this church was put out of business by the one in the distance you see there. Okay, and this gives you sort of a bird's eye view of the excavations her team has done over several years there. And there's been a bunch of things found, but I have to say the most spectacular thing is the churchyard, which as you can see, has dead people in it. Now, some of the deposits in the church are really particularly interesting because it looks like a mass grave. These are a bunch of people who seem to be all buried together, and you can see the horizontal stripes going across them are the remains of a boat, or a fragment of a boat. You can see it a little bit more closely if we zoom in here. Those are human ribs, and lying across them is the decayed remains of a clinker-built boat, and then the boat nails that are clinching it together. So this looks like a whole bunch of folks who died together, were buried together, and had a shattered boat put over them. The obvious conclusion that something bad happened out in the water is possible, but we can't prove it, but there they are. Sad. But now, we can do all sorts of things to learn about these people. This is a whole bunch of radiocarbon dates, AMS dates, and we can get an idea of how old they were when they died, and they all were a range of different ages. They all died together. And we can do other things. With strontium isotopes, strontium builds up in your teeth, sorry, builds up in your teeth as you age. And strontium is based upon groundwater where you're growing up. And groundwater strontium levels are based upon the bedrock. And not to make a very long story short, but the different bedrocks of Europe allow you to fingerprint where people are born and where they wind up dying. And if they're very different, that becomes very interesting. So we have been using the services of our good friend Doug Price and Hildur Guest's daughter, who have been using strontium isotopes on teeth from Iceland and from Greenland, from elsewhere in the North Atlantic, to really try to start fingerprinting the Norse spread. We can begin to tell where people in these pagan graves and Christian graves were born. And if you're really clever, if you trick the difference between the incisors, which come in early, and those wisdom teeth, which you all remember having coming in, you can actually see people moving in their lifetimes if you look at the changes in teeth. Okay, so look at this group of people. A bunch of them were born in Iceland. A few of the younger people were born in Greenland. They all wound up buried on the same boat. Are they related to each other? Yes, we did the ancient DNA. Uh, the two children are related to one of the women. One of the men is almost certainly the father of the two children. Uh, a bunch of other people are not related. Some of the other people are related, but at a much more distant level. So what we're looking at here looks like some of the first wave of Christian colonists that are coming over with Eric the Red. The people listen to the propaganda about Greenland being Greenland. Because as you know the story, Eric said that Iceland had been badly named, and if you wanted someone to go to some place, you had to give a good name like Greenland. So Yetta's label for this really interesting presentation was Deceived by Eric the Red. And here's the people that were. And of course, she also has some really cool work looking at diet through isotopes. One of the really cool things which people can do in laboratories now is use nitrogen, carbon, and increasingly sulfur isotopes to pull out information about diet of long dead folks. And essentially what you're seeing here is a whole bunch of Icelanders and Greenlanders who are all in the Viking period, including the Greenland people we just saw, that are sort of down to the lower end of the nitrogen isotope level, mm -hmm. which means they're in the terrestrial food web and only partly in the marine food web. And these folks are much lighter in nitrogen, and which suggests that they are in the marine food web. Now, we can't tell the difference between them eating fish, marine fish, or seals. We think it's seals, but things are changing through time. Watch this slide, we will come back to it. Okay, and then there's caribou. Remember we were talking about hierarchy in Greenland and who owns the caribou. And um, okay, the caribou were certainly an owned resource. But one of the things to think about is caribou in Greenland, especially in the Southwest, are very fragile inherently because they're very, f very subject to range icing in the wintertime. Let's say uh, rain falls in wintertime, ice crust forms, they can't get through it, they all die. Uh, and we know that this happens fairly regularly. In Iceland, in Greenland, rather, caribou populations tend to be segmented. They're broken up by, by geography. Now, today, there are no caribou surviving in the eastern settlement area. And that's not because of climate entirely. It's because they were hunting. Between 1700 and 1800, when guns were introduced to the then Inuit Greenlanders, they shot them all. So it's quite possible to combine <coughs> overhunting 
with range issues with, in this period, competition for domesticated grazing animals and make caribou in Greenland locally extinct. No problem at all, easy to do. And they didn't do it. Is this another example of sustainable management and top down? Think about European examples. Yep, Robin Hood, Sheriff of Nottingham. Who's the good guy, who's the bad guy? Who's the poacher? Who's the environmental control officer? Hmm, think about it that way. Top-down management can work sometimes too. Okay, so we have then some sustainable caribou perhaps. We also have some stories about intensification of wool production of sheep. Now, I'm for once not showing you bar grass of sheep. I'm showing you actual bits of wool and cloth coming from frozen deposits in Greenland. And this is the work of Michelle Here Smith from Brown University, who gives a very good talk herself, by the way, I should mention. So what Michelle Smith has been able to demonstrate looking at these unprepossessing pieces of cloth, remember I'm a zooarchaeologist, not a cloth person, um, it's been remarkable. Because she's been able to demonstrate is in both Greenland and Iceland, in the Viking Age, there's huge variability in the kind of cloth being produced, just as so you expect if every woman was producing cloth at home in an artisanal fashion. Lots of variability. And then in Iceland, but not in Greenland, variability drops off. Standardization comes in. And by 1300, in scraps of cloth coming from Iceland, the cloth is forming the legally required standard of Vathmal, which is written down in text, it is becoming a commodity like the fish. So cloth is becoming a commodity too in Iceland, but not in Greenland. And again, consider the time frame. Okay, so the Greenlanders never really get into the cloth trade. They don't get into the dried fish trade. They continue with the walrus. Okay, other things which, um, thanks. Other things which don't happen is erosion. In Greenland, you just do not see the same kinds of indications of large-scale erosion that you see in Iceland. So maybe the Greenlanders did not intensify cloth production, did not crank up the number of sheep they had there, but they also did inflict quite the same kind of environmental damage on their pastures. So trade-offs. Okay, so summing up Greenland then, by 1250 or so, it was a small but well-established community. It was very well integrated with communal use of seals and hunting of birds together. Successful caribou conservation. The walrus ivory and the hunt that fuels it keeps going. Very big stone churches. Substantially larger than most parish churches in Iceland at the same time period. And we know they were elaborately furnished with stained glass, imported church bells, pretty fancy things. And everything you could ask for with medieval Christendom. There was a bishop. There was a monastery, there was a nunnery, social stratification, Robin Hood, everything. And then things change. One piece of change that happens is culture contact. The ancestors of the modern Inuit Greenlanders enter Greenland from the north, from Canada, ultimately Alaska, uh, around 1200 AD. They spread down the coast of Greenland. Uh, by 1300, winter settlements are in the outer fjord zone of the Norse settlements. Now, we don't know many details of this contact situation. We wish we knew more. But there's one documentary a reference from uh, Historia Norvegiae, a uh, source written in the 13th century, uh, talks about first contact between our hunters of the Norse and these Skraling people in the Disco Bay region, the Nordic Sater area. And it says that they're, you know, they don't know about iron. They use walrus tusks for tools, very good ethnographic observation. They wear skin clothes. But the interesting things about them, if you hit them with a sword or an axe, the wounds don't bleed. But then when they finally die, the blood just gushes out. Then it goes on to talk about something else, all of which suggests that that initial contact may not have left Inuit people feeling really positive about the Norse. Um, so you, we don't know. Now, there are other stories later on suggesting that much more complicated relationships may have taken place. But at the end of the day, the Norse are replaced by the Thule people in Greenland, as the Thule people replace the Dorset folks in Canada. We don't know much about the interaction here. Uh, the last record on the Norse side is from the 1370s, in which 18 men and two boys are, carried, are killed or carried off as prisoners uh, in a, a battle with the Inuit. And if this is the sort of thing that's happening, you don't have to have a, uh, a Mongol-style invasion 
to wipe out the Norse. All you have to do is raise the cost of going after those seals and marine adaptation, and that could certainly have a negative impact. Okay, we also realize that there's something missing in this interaction between the, the Norse and the Inuit, which is the interchange of technology. Uh, the toggling harpoons and all the sophisticated ice hunting gear which the Inuit have to offer the Norse aren't being taken. The Norse don't get more harpoons later, and they also significantly do not get the bones of the seals that are the ice breathing seals, the ring seals, the bearded seals. So there's a cost to this, this failed relationship they've got going here. Now, if you contrast this to what happened later in the 18th century when Scandinavians recontacted Greenland and people associated with missionary Hans Eide came there in the 1720s, within nine months there was a Metis population building up. There's immediate interaction between the Greenlanders Inuit Greenlanders and the incoming Danes and Norwegians, and that laid the foundation for the very vigorous Greenlandic society you see today, where people are very rapidly interchanging technology, language, biology very quickly. That didn't happen in the Middle Ages, and we don't know why. Okay. But that wasn't the only thing happening to the Norse Greenlanders. Uh, sea cores demonstrate that that <coughs> cooling we're seeing, that volcano blowing up 1258, is having the effect of bringing to West Greenland this thick, deep summer ice that is so characteristic today. The store east, the big ice that comes in the summer that interferes with navigation is coming between 1250 and 1300, and boy, is it causing trouble. Clearly, it's disrupting navigation. This is the source of the iceberg that got the Titanic. So it certainly would do in smaller boats as well. But also, it had more subtle impacts. It reduces the growing season of pastures along the, the coast. And that's, of course, where most of the pastures were for the North Greenlanders. It also drives away harbor seal colonies. So it reduces the range of seals which the North had available to them. Bad news indeed. Plus, temperatures dropping like a rock. Proactivity of pastures is going down. What happens? Well, if the old story we told to Gerard Diamond was true, and these people were inflexible, inadaptable, not very good at survival, they would have become extinct right then, bam, gone by 1300. But if you remember the dates, that's not what happens. They last another 100, and perhaps 150 years, despite having this real challenge, their TEK, in this case, a threshold crossing change. What do they do? Well, we can actually tell you the answer to that now. Combining animal bones and isotopes in human bodies we can tell what they're doing. What they're doing is they're going further into the marine food web by cranking up seals. They're going communal seal hunting before, and now they're going communal seal hunting bigger, faster, harder. They're intensifying that. They're using their ability to coordinate community labor to get more people, more boats out there during the short period when the seals are migrating up the coast to kill a whole bunch of them, bring them in, and you can see, well, you don't need the line there. There's a trend taking place here. If you look again at Yetta's data here, for people going to the marine food web, there it is. After 1250, that's where the shift comes. That's where the Greenlanders start going seriously marine, diverging from the Icelandic pattern, despite the fact the Icelanders are stealing a lot of fish. Okay, so putting it all together here very quickly, declining cl uh, climate, the red dots are people going into the marine food web. There's the animal bones with more seal bones going up there. And there is a deadly crunch point, and you can see they go through it. So at this point, we can actually see the Norse Greenlanders, as clearly I think we're going to without a time machine, adapting to climate change, responding successfully to a really major hit. I mean, this is threshold crossing change. This is the worst possible climate impact they can get. It's outside of their accumulated TK by a long shot, and they survive it. So much for being a society that chose to fail. These people were fighting desperately to survive. They're using the best tools they had available to them. They intensified what they're doing. They did it better, harder, and they won another 100 years or so. But sometimes doing one thing right leaves you vulnerable to other things happening. This is that storminess curve again. That's the marine diet coming on there, and that's the stepwise change in storminess. Just as they are getting themselves really set to really go after those seals, to put more people in boats out in that outer fjords to get the seals, to bring them back, it gets much more stormy. 1425, things flip over. It's not the perfect storm. It's a whole bunch of really terrible storms. So now you're in a situation 
where all the seafaring expertise tied to seas and tied to specific places accumulated over 40 generations of occupation in Greenland turns on you. All of your expectations, all of your TEK, all of your understanding of how things work in Greenland now are being flipped over. Some Inuit elders today are reluctant now to pass on their centuries old ice, winter ice experience to younger people because as they say, I'm afraid I'm going to get somebody killed because things are so different. So we don't know what happens at the end of North Greenland, but we suspect that one serious event could have been an event, a loss of life at sea, which would have been enough to make it really difficult for them to survive, especially given that it wasn't just one thing happening to them, it's multiple things at once. In Europe, the Black Death comes, and we don't know if it reaches Greenland, we don't think it does. It does reach Iceland in the 1400s, but it collapses their markets. <coughs> and then there is the interaction with the Inuit, which we do not understand, but which does not seem to end well for the Norse. So a whole bunch of things come together. And again, we don't know the answer, but we can begin to see some of the outlines. And we know that the old easy experience, that these were people who chose to fail and did, is simply wrong. So to end up then, some lessons from the North Atlantic. You can be very well adapted on the short to medium scale, survive major challenges, and go extinct anyway. The story we told Jared Diamond was in some ways comforting. You know, silly Vikings, inflexible, unresilient, screw up, die. Not like us at all, right? But this one's a little more disturbing, isn't it? So other things to think about is trade-offs, specialization, generalization, have costs. Limiting the range of your traditional ecological knowledge has costs. Could the Norse have survived if they'd adopted Inuit-style seal hunting? We don't know for sure, but it certainly would have made their lives easier, perhaps longer. It would give them another seasonal source of food. Cross-regional connections have costs. You know, not switching over to bulk goods had cost to North Greenlanders. And yet connecting up to the world system had cost to the Icelanders too. You know, arguably that was one of the things that helped them get through the climate shifts of the 1200s, 1300s, but in 1401, 1403, the Black Death came to Iceland and many people died. Indeed, enough people died that you could actually see in the Tefra records in southern Iceland environmental recovery. The grass is growing back. So many people have died. Well, Bad for people, good for grass. So these connections can be good things and they can be bad things both. And I think the sense of conjuncture <coughs> of how things come together or don't is very critical. We've seen all these different things from Genghis Khan to volcanoes blowing up, through Inuit migration, through decisions made by particular Norse managers in particular moments, all coming together at different time scales different geographical scales. This is complicated, fascinating, but complicated. As one of my friends who's a historian said, well, you know, this conjuncture stuff is strange. Sometimes you shoot the Archduke, nothing happens. Sometimes you shoot the Archduke and World War I happens. Why? So these are the kinds of things that we are collectively grappling with and trying to understand this issue of pathways and pathway divergence and why some pathways seem to lead you to these shut-ended situations such as the North Greenland has found themselves in, and others lead you to one of the best places to live in the world. Thank you very much. years ago, I was a student at Dartmouth College, and I heard a great lecture from uh, Buckminster Fuller. Okay. And uh, he was uh, very creative at that point in time and said, uh, I'm going to tell you a story of the change to the center of economic development in the world. And he threw up a map, and there it was, the North Pole, the center mm -hmm. of the map. He said, if you look around and see all of this development that's going on out here, in 2050, this whole world is going to change. All the cultural, economic, and other <coughs> factors are going to be influenced by what happens in the Arctic. Mm -hmm. 
how do you think that that interchange of populations, of cultures, mm -hmm. of everything is going to have uh, an anthropomorphic change to our uh, mm -hmm. society? This is a great regional uh, definition. What about the <coughs> larger picture? Of I think that the, uh, the, the circumpolar zone, you know, Iceland seen from above, was a slide I used in a presentation we did in, in, uh, in Reykjavik just a few weeks ago. And if you think of that view, Iceland is not a marginal part of Europe. It's a central part of the circumpolar zone, a whole third of it. So I mean, I think there is no question that Iceland is, in the past, as in the future, a really key portion of this, this place, this zone. I think that there's a lot of different answers to your question, and some of them I need a crystal ball for, um, or, or a bigger head or something. But for some of the things, thinking back to the past, you have the, the question about how can the past, how can examples like this, research like this, aid us in understanding the future? You know, lessons of history have been kind of overdone. You know, we're not the Norse. You know, we have a lot more power, we have a lot more resources. On the other hand, we are facing some of the same kinds of challenges, rapid change, globalization, unexpected things, pandemic issues, and unexpected outcomes, decisions look like they make good sense in one circumstance when suddenly circumstances change, lock us into very bad places. So these kinds of principles are the sorts of things which you as a team are trying to look at as an offering from the past to the present and future. To also think about Iceland as a circumpolar perspective, all of us had TEK, all of us have TEK, all of us had TEK in circa 1200 or so. But if you think about the circumpolar zone of 1200, one part of that zone, Iceland, was generating something different. It was generating an indigenous written TEK, an indigenous written record, which was not other people writing about you, which tends to be the, the fate of Arctic peoples. You know, they're all written about by somebody else who often doesn't know much about them um, or doesn't, doesn't think well of them. The Icelanders produced their own history. And I said, beginning, not only their own history, but the history of people around them as well. So they have produced a resource which I think has huge unrealized potential in terms of the circumpolar perspective of the indigenous written record of over a thousand years of an indigenous northern people who are having their own view of how things operate, how things work. So one of the things we're doing now with our friends from Iceland is working with them to sort of to reposition the huge history of saga scholarship around the idea of, of thinking about long-term environmental change with this incredible gift of literacy and this long-term perspective. So we're, we're collaborating our colleagues in Iceland and Sweden uh, on a project which has informally been called Sagas for Sustainability. And, and we have lots more of that on the website. We could talk about that for hours, but maybe I better not. But we're, we're trying to, to really put these things together. Um, well, your time window was, was largely the 9th to 15th century or thereabouts, and mm -hmm. you made a lot of close comparisons about the climate then. I wonder if I could invite you to uh, bring it up to the present and compare, uh, see if there were there were comments you might have about the climate you inferred at the height of eastern and western settlements and the climate you were mm -hmm. experiencing as your team were doing the digs today. One thing we can tell you with absolute certainty, it's mm -hmm. warmer now than any time it was in the medieval period. Uh, we can tell this with six certainty because what we're discovering is is the conditions of preservation of these deep stratified middens are going to pieces. Sites that I visited like in the 80s and you know they were still frozen and you can get down the, the trenches made by the guys in the 1930s and there was hair and feathers still sticking out, the, the profile, incredible preservation. They're all mush now, they're bone mush. My colleague Conrad Smirowski who's planning to build his PhD on hundreds of sites now has three to work with because all the rest of them have just melted and it's gone to pieces. So we're now engaged in a, in a desperate rescue operation with our colleagues in Denmark and Greenland to try to rescue as much as we can. So Conrad and his, his stalwart band are going out working with our friends in Greenland uh, next summer and summer afterwards at the Bishop's Farm at Garter Igalico mm -hmm. to try to rescue at least that. We can't save them all, but we have to save at least that one unique site as much of the record as we can. So I can tell you absolutely totally, it was warmer now than it was then. High to medieval warm period, nowhere near as warm, at least locally on those particular spots. Is this uh, citable somewhere? It's an argument that occurs quite often. It is, and, and I'll, I'll get it to you. 
Uh, it's mostly citable in a whole bunch of grant proposals we just saw saying, ah, give us money, it's going to go that. You know, that kind of thing. You know, sort of, we, we said more articulately in the grant proposal because we got the money. But you can see the, the, that's the thing. But yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, you talked about the storminess increasing in the loss of life, probably mm -hmm. in terms of votes and what have you. Do you think it got to a point where it wasn't worth continuing? And so people just, in effect, left mm -hmm. and went back to Iceland or. In other words, they just departed the premises and said we mm -hmm. no longer have a stable enough population to keep going. I think that's certainly an option. I mean, there's there's a there's an ongoing debate about what actually happened to the Greenlanders. Yeah. You know, I mean, did they leave? Uh, did they just say, okay, that's it, we're done? You know, and we're we're moving out, uh, or did they die in C2, or some combination of those things? We really don't know the answer to that one. I mean, all I can say is that. By the time you're getting to sort of end game, where you're down to the last couple thousand Greenlanders, um, you're really on this knife edge between enough labor, enough hands, enough mouths. You know, it's one of those, those rapid, rapid bad things happening in North things could happen. But on the other hand, if you take 2,000 people from Greenland and drop them in Iceland, you know, even in 1450, 1500, somebody would have said something about it. You know, Icelanders, again, look at all those books. They're literate. They write things down. And if you had all these people showing up, especially if they were doing what they probably would have been doing, which is claiming old property rights or becoming obnoxious and starting lawsuits with people, um, you know, but people do that sort of thing, um, they, would have been, they would have been historically visible. And significantly, nobody in Europe knew what happened to the Greenlanders. You know, right up to the 17th century, they kept appointing bishops of Greenland and Rome. They never left. But also, Hans Aedy. The, the Apostle of Greenland, the, the guy who went from Norway to Christianize him, who did incredibly thorough research, as far as we know, in all the various Norwegian archives before he left about Greenland, fully believed that he was going to Greenland to, Christian, or to, to de-Catholicize you know, these, these popish, you know, ancient you know, Vikings that needed to be made into good Lutherans. You know, that's what he's, he's all set for that. And it took him two years of exploration to finally regretfully come to the conclusion that the only thing people left to Christianize were Inuit, and then he settled down and started working on them. But so if he didn't know the Norse were really gone, I think that really reduces the likelihood there are any significant numbers of, of refugees getting to any part of Europe where they could report back. So, so I mean, in my heart of hearts, I'd like to have them get away, but I don't think they did. I think maybe that's where we need to end. We, um, but, uh, First off, I just like to say I think Stephenson would have been especially pleased by this talk, by its interdisciplinarity and thinking about the, the future of the Arctic through understanding the past and the resilience of our peoples. That's just what you wrote about and thought about. Um, I think we need to start making plans to go to Iceland for the next talk in, in 2014. So um, we'll, we'll check in on that. And I, and I want to want to thank Tom for a, a, a quite a remarkable set of ideas, theories, and a walk through Iceland and Greenland, and um, just, just a, a wonderful talk. All, all I can say, thank you so much. We do, we, we do. Thank you. Thank you. But we do this Viking style in Neba. We steal from the best. So this is all the best research of my colleagues, which I have put together. It's not mine, but thank you. And then come down front if you have more questions.